<clears throat> right, uh, I think we should make a start because I need to finish uh, a bit early today. So good morning, welcome back from your long holiday. Hope that you have had a good time with your family. And uh, yes, <laughs> that's good. That's good. <clears throat> Did you get lots of duit raya? Or are you too old now to get such thing? <laughs> Alright, um, so um, we're going to resume our, our lesson for um, uh, the, the second half of the remaining semester. Um, so basically, what's gonna uh, happen for the next seven, eight weeks um, is you're going to learn. Basically, um, you you have to learn three important things, um, namely the plant crop nutrition, the introduction to it, and then you're going to learn about um, the plant growth regulators, um, the hormones, hormones in plants. And then you're going to learn about the um, general plant development, especially in uh, relating to <coughs> um, fruit and fr flower and fruit uh, development. Okay, uh, we we would like to make everything into uh, context uh, so that you can see that okay, this is the uh, overview of what you have learned and eventually this is the thing that you get from uh, this course okay all right so let's make a start uh, I hope most of you have joined please wake up your friends <coughs> uh, make them join okay so <coughs> our lesson today is about uh, crop nutrition and mineral nutrients absorption admittedly uh, these uh, sorry I need to um, share my screen. I forgot to do that. <coughs> All right. <coughs> um, can you sh see my screen now? Just checking. Yes, doctor. Okay. <coughs> okay. So um, we're going to have a look at the crop nutrition and mineral mineral nutrients absorption. I think to some degree you have learned very basic very fundamental about these two topics okay uh, crop nutri uh, nutrition in general you have learned about that of course and mineral nutrients i think if you have taken your soil science you should be uh, familiar enough with the concept of minerals um, elements and ions cations and so on and also the concept of absorption and adoption absorption to the soil uh, particles okay right <clears throat> my <clears throat> um, quick advice is when it comes to learning nutrition regardless of which direction that you're going to go um, after you're done with your program you know, you're not you're not necessarily interested with crop nutrition. Maybe you are more into breeding. Maybe some of you more into uh, biochemistry or, or crop physiology, like I am. I'm a plant physiologist. Uh, maybe some of you are more interested with the modeling, biostatistics, and so on. Regardless of that, I would like to advise you to have a good understanding about nutrition because not only for the sake of your exams uh, for this uh, uh, course from nutrition but because this is going to be of benefit to you as well at the human level you see when you understand the nutrients what is meant by that <clears throat> and also the requirement um, in the plants and of course by ourselves not only that you can take care of your plants you maybe now is not really the problem because you're still young in the later part of life you know how to take good care of yourself okay because 
living in the modern age now, we are exposed in various highly processed food. And this can actually hamper our, our, our health and our general um, vitality. So, um, have a, um, I, w I would say, encourage yourself, persuade yourself to like and understand nutrition, okay? For, not just for the sake of your exams now, but for the sake of uh, you at the individual level, okay? So what is meant by nutrients? Nutrients is basically um, the components of food. So depending on what organisms you are or uh, depending which part of the world you're from, you're going to have different kind of food, okay? And maybe uh, for, for the Chinese, they uh, have the Chinese food, right? Uh, they have all the um, dim sum, they have uh, all the um, noodles, wonton me, and for the Indian, they have all the roti, they have all the, um, you know, tandoori and so on, and for the Malay as well. Regardless of the kind of foods presented to you, these foods actually contain nutrients and these nutrients fall into major categories that we are familiar with, namely carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, water and so on. Okay, So nutrients are the components that need to build the bodies to grow. It's true, okay, for both of you and also for the plants, okay? And the nutrients are also needed to repair the damaged part of the bodies and provide energy to carry out life processes, okay? When you are a living organism, you carry out life processes. Your, your cells are living, are meta, metabolizing actively um, just to, to repair, to divide, to um, differentiate, uh, and, and, and so on. Okay, so these all require nutrients and energy to do that. And when you study about all these nutrients, this is the field that we call as the, uh, the study of nutrition. We understand the mode of food taking by organism and then how does it get utilized in the body uh, of that particular organism. So it can be wherever that you're learning now, it's, we call it crop nutrition. We learn what is important to be consumed by the crops and then how this is get um, metabolized in the crop to what functions okay for example you take nutrient a get into the body of a plant what does it do there are so many nutrients out there and each nutrient has its own role and function okay to differentiate between us human mammals um, with plants we are uh, that is known uh, nutritionally known as the heterotrophic um, organism, the, our nutrition type, because uh, we cannot manufacture our own food. We have to obtain it from um, other sources, external sources. But for the front, it's called autotrophic, okay? Uh, because plants can basically well, you know, plants do not have to go to cafeteria or go to, to call or for, for panda food. They, they can just uh, manufacture their own food by um, gathering all these basic building units and they are very much capable to live on their own, okay? But we can't. We, we rely very much on plants. So the very first uh, process that enable plants to do so, to become autotrophic, is I hope you still remember from your lectures before you um, um, underwent your semester break, mid semester break. It's the photosynthesis, okay? So, this is why I keep telling you photosynthesis that is the basic of all plant studies, okay? This is the start of everything. Whenever you study about crop, about the plants, about agriculture, even if you go to, to the non direct listening um, kind of field in agriculture like the um, e uh, global economics I mean like okay that that doesn't go to the farm no but you still need to understand the photosynthesis because this is give 
what gives impact uh, to how uh, agricultural inputs is utilized and managed um, globally. Okay, so please recall back from your <coughs> photosynthesis machinery lesson uh, about your photosynthesis. I hope you remember this. So we have the light ration and also the light independent ration, uh, the products from each of these and how they function. Okay, right. So being the autotrophic um, organism also means that the plant is able to synthesize uh, proteins, meaning that they can make their own proteins. Can we make our own protein? Yes, but not all. Because the building block of proteins, namely the amino acids, so proteins is made from amino acids. Yes, amino acids. Okay. Um, there are 20 amino acids. I think it amino acid is called the essential amino acid. Essential amino acid because our bodies cannot make these amino acids. Okay, we have to obtain it from the plants. But the plants can pretty much survive on their own. Okay, they because they have the ability to absorb nitrogen, which is uh, the elements utilized a lot in making proteins. Okay, so now you understand why you have to um, uh, eat uh, various type of foods. Okay, because each type of food will cater to various nutritional needs that your body cannot meet or cannot manufacture at all. Like the essential amino acids, uh, vitamin C. Our body cannot make vitamin C. Okay, we're not some kind of um, lizard. Um, in the in in the uh, desert, uh, those uh, animals they they can manufacture their own vitamin C, but we can't. Okay, right. Um, however, bear in mind, not all plants photosynthesize. Predominantly, okay. Some plants are parasitic. They are parasite. Okay, they don't really photosynthesize, but they. They get their nutrients, food from from other plants. Okay, and these plants, of course, uh, since they are not uh, photosynthesizing, they join us in the nu nutrition modes. They are heterotopic. For example, uh, the 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 daughter plant. You see this a uh, stringy looking plants covering this whole tree. Yeah, this is a daughter plant. Um, the, this is not a tropical plant. You you can't see it here. Uh, I've got some um, another example here. This is called the um, the dalu down labor. Okay, and this is the the dalu plant. Okay, this is the, the dalu plant, and this is the host plant. You can see how how different it looks, but somehow. If you don't pay close attention, you think it's part of the same tree, but actually it's not. Okay, it's parasitic. It's living off the life essence of its host uh, tree. Okay, right. Um, what are the common example? There are many other example. Okay, so please bear in your mind: not all plants are. Um, autotrophic. When when uh, when people keep saying that the plants are autotrophic, plant are photosynthesizing, that is in general speaking, meaning like ninety five percent perhaps of the whole plant's um, population photosynthesizing. Okay, but not all of them. Okay, there is always exception because you're dealing with biology, you're dealing with nature. There is always exception. Hence the word. Okay. Um, okay, look at this plant. This is the, the, the mistletoe. Um, that's the host tree, and uh, this is the mistletoe. You can see here. Alright. And uh, mistletoe, we, we have our v tropical version of mistletoe, but uh, this is the mistletoe, the actual uh, mistletoe. Um, what, what, what plant is this? Um, mistletoe, I think in the Western culture, um, it's quite uh, it, it has got some some quite uh, significant impact on the culture um, I'm not encouraging you to do this but if you watch the, the, the Western movies 
if, if the movie got some kind of um, Happy New Year scenes, you can see that the actor uh, actress is kissing right under something. Usually that's something they will have the New Year kiss under the mistletoe. It's for the good luck, okay? So this plant, even though it's parasitic, it's regarded as good luck for some reason, okay? All right. Another thing yet that you need to, uh, to to bear in mind, just because the plants are living on another plants, doesn't mean that they are parasitic. Sometimes there are epiphytes, okay? They just live there to support their growth needs, okay? They are not parasitic, okay? And we have loads of them as well, all right? They just, um, uh, they live symbiotically sometimes or mutually sometimes or commensally sometimes with with the host plant okay we have this um, stack horn plants we have this uh, bromeliad i'll just read the name okay this is the stack horn fern stack horn fern this is the uh, bromeliad bromeliad this is, I think I know this is, uh, Tillandsia. So these, these are all the example of um, uh, epiphyte uh, plants, okay? Some plants, um, they are neither heterotrophic or autotrophic, but they are rather carnivorous, okay? Uh, because they live in such a nutrient-lacking kind of environment uh, meaning that uh, for example they live in the acid box uh, acid box um, this is uh, equivalent to our our region it's called the pit or the gumboot meaning that when you're standing on the land that actually is not the land this is actually the decayed plant materials okay so in general it's called the box okay and it's very acidic, it's very acidic, so even the nutrients are there, so it, it, they are not available to the plants because they're just too acidic. So the plants need to supplement their uh, uh, nutritional needs by becoming carnivorous. So they modify the leaf, it becomes the trap, and then some insect get in, uh, attracted to it, and then it will be trapped and then digested. There are a few examples, you've got your Venus fly trap here, okay? Got your Venus fly trap here, fly trap. Um, I think the Latin name for this is, is Dionia, uh, Saracenia. This is Saracenia, and then this is Nephantis. Um, Nephantis, Nephantis. What's that, Emily? I think I know there's Emily. Keep. Ah, uh, uh, it's the peaches plant. It's the Periocera. Okay, so it's very slippery. Um, uh, got some inside the insects pretty much cannot escape uh, once it's trapped the digestive nutrients of the uh, pitcher's plant is going to digest it and become the nutrients for the plant okay right so some plants you can see it's got this um, symbiotic relationship uh, okay, um, because um, they live together with the host plant okay so for example in here <coughs> um, the, the the plants they kind of um, provides um, I mean the host it, it provides uh, the nutrients um, needed uh, by by the um, its partner symbiotic partner and in return the symbiotic uh, partner gives some kind of uh, protections to the host plant or give uh, other nutrients that the host plant can cannot manufacture and and so on. Okay, so this is a, a very beautiful way the nature has been designed. You can see there's a diversity of uh, nutrition modes present in the nature. Okay, so these are a uh, summary of what we uh, we have seen so far. You so, so you got your epiphyte, you got your parasite plant, and also the carnivorous plants. Okay. What about crops? Okay, so when you talk about crops, crops pretty much are grown in such a way we call it as the monoculture. Okay, 
and when this happens naturally the nutrients that are present in the soil cannot be um, sufficient or enough to cater for the continuously growing monoculture crops so in order to replenish back all the nutrients that's why the farmers keep uh, fertilizing the land okay because um, for the nutrients in the soil to become available it takes time as you can learn uh, as you have learned um, it's through the process of um, weathering okay breaking breaking down of soil break breaking down of um, I would say uh, minerals minerals uh, uh, rocks to get soil and nutrients however this this process is is rather uh, slow and it takes time to happen okay uh, but in the monoculture you need to grow things very fast right so that's why um, you have the fer fertilization program okay all right okay so um, uh, just a quick summary for this section regardless of um, the nutrients that the plants require they still have to gather all these nutrients various elements or vitamins or something in order to form these three macronutrients okay so this is what we call as macronutrients why because they are the combination of all these um, elements um, together to form a more complex structure and this story is of course true for both the plants and also us the human okay so the macronutrients that um, the plants need and us need as well is the carbohydrates fat oil or lipid and also the protein okay so because the plants is able to um, make all of these um, various macronutrients from these building blocks that's why we get the proteins from the plant okay uh, protein example from the plant these are all animal sources uh, like the soy the beans yeah okay you got the bean okay and then the carbohydrates um, that's the your 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 starch your lipids your oil you get we get um, like yeah like your oil pump right your oil pump produce palm oil Okay, and that is um, needed by by us the humans, and not just for our um, nutritional needs, but for various other industries as well, and also water. Okay, yes, um, in some part of of the world, uh, they don't have the luxury like us. We have access to water all the time. Um, Sometimes, you know, water is is so uh, scarce that you get the water from the thing that you eat. Uh, so, for example, like the the watermelon. I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing this correctly so watermelon was a watermelon it's about 95% water so when you eat watermelon not not that only you get this protein carbohydrate and lipid but you get the water as well okay so that is a very very uh, plus point all right okay so what about the mineral nutrition in plants so plants, as you know, are very capable to manufacture their own food because they are autotrophic. As long as they are being provided with all the building blocks for the foods. Okay, as you can see, these are the building blocks for the food. It's pretty much the same thing. Okay, carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay, so these you can regard as the framework frame work nutrients because regardless of any um, macronutrients that comes um, later this is always the building block the framework okay or the backbone sometimes people call it the backbone as well the backbone nutrient 
carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, the CHO. Okay. And for the proteins, of course, a protein it's it's more complicated and it's got uh, many structure and function as well. So sometimes all this um, CHO it's going to be attached with various other elements, okay, like the um, nitrogen, the sulfur, and um, and phosphate group as well. Okay. So where do plants get all of these um, elements? So in basic, it comes from the soil. Okay, and also the atmosphere. Because remember, plants has the two part. It has got it has got the the ground, the canopy, and also the underground. And nutrient can get into the plant using various entries okay remember plants do not only absorb nutrients through roots okay plants can also absorb nutrients through leaf through stem okay there, there are openings okay right so why why is it important to study the mineral nutrition Okay. So basically, mineral is inorganic elements. I hope you still remember from what you have learned in your soil science. <coughs> so, and the nutrient is the uh, substance needed to uh, do the necessary synthesis or or of organic um, compounds. Okay. So minerals is usually the combination of um, two things, two or three things. I'll give you. I'll give you uh, one simple um, example. Um, you have your um, magnesium. Magnesium, right? So stand alone, this is called the element. Yeah. However, in nature, magnesium not present as an individual element like this okay you don't suddenly find okay there is a magnesium lots of magnesium in the soil it is always bound to something it's creating a mineral so usually you're going to find something like magnesium chloride okay magnesium chloride okay and this is a type of um, mineral Okay. okay, some people want to call it salt. It does is correct as well, right? And of course, this has to be broken down first before the plant can utilize each of this magnesium and also the chlorine. Okay, chloride is not element. Okay, that is the form of this uh, compound when it's in the form of salt. The element is chlorine. Okay, so I would like. To urge you to get your terminologies correct, okay, when it comes to this um, chem um, chemistry stuff, for example, stuff like um, silicon or silica. Which one is the element? Silicon or silica? Stuff like that. Please get it correct, okay? Right. So, the mineral nutrition, of course, this is needed to promote um, your crop yield that is the sole point okay it just it's not because to make your plants happy of course this do make your your crops are uh, very happy hence the production of uh, crop yield you can see that with the increment of fertilizer the crop yield kind of increase as well but only to a certain point only after that, if you increase the, the, the fertilizer, you're going to get some increment, but not as much as here. Okay, the slope is not as steep as here. Why? Because the the utilization is low here. Low nutrient utilization. Very high nutrient utilization. That's why there, there are so many studies to, stud, uh, to know. Um... A crop nutrition for various crops and plants because if each crop and plants utilize nutrients uh, differently it depends on various things environment soil type 
uh, soil type, um, the crop species, and so on. High nutrients utilization. utilization. All right. Okay. Still remember this? This is your beloved periodic tables of elements. Okay. How many? How many? How many elements do we have? You know what? Let's 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 ask uh, uh, um, Google how how many how many elements do we have? How many elements are there? Hundred and eighteen. Okay, we have hundred and eighteen elements. Okay, this thing keeps increasing. Okay, depending on what else has been found or being managed to be manufactured in the labs okay not all elements are present in nature okay some elements are only lab made okay so out of the 118 elements okay plants require about nine plus eight plants require about 17 elements 17 out of 118 as the essential nutrient to complete its life cycle okay so and these um, elements they reside in various group okay they are from group one group two you can see here from 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 this um, size of the periodic table as well and also um, in the middle as well okay so what is meant by essential nutrient um, elements which are required for the plant to grow from seed and to produce the seed again to complete its life cycle okay sometimes if you take um, one of the um, elements um, the plants it can grow vegetatively producing all the leaves uh, stems but it cannot produce the flowers because the nutrients are not enough okay so if you provide the nutrient which is lacking then the plant can flower and then complete the life cycle all right so 17 elements how do we know 17 so this um, came from a very long time ago the experiment okay um, I would like to remind you one thing it depends on the uh, books that you read some books say that you need 16 elements some books say that you need 17 some books say that you need 18 okay so um, we like to stay on the fence so that's why we use the 17 okay if that's only 16 um, it doesn't take into account um, it minus um, nickel okay here we plus the nickel okay if it's 18 it can plus um, with the nickel of course nickel plus uh, it can be very thick. it can be um, sil um, silicon it can be vanadium it can be cobalt and so on or, or sodium uh, sodium okay sodium okay. <clears throat> so uh, depending on um, the school of thoughts that you go to uh, they, they're going to call uh, within these numbers only okay but I would say that uh, 70 is, is good number I mean like pretty much uh, across the crop species around the world plus um, whatever um, kind of soil that you're dealing with regularly when you do the, the plants uh, elemental analysis you're going to find that these 17 um, regularly present um, in, in a plant right okay so um, there's a concept of macronutrients and micro um, nutrients okay so from from this um, 17 elements you get the macro you get the micro nutrients with relations to the abundance of these elements inside um, the plants okay right okay so there's a story down here or when the nickel was added 
um, to this uh, 17 elements um, uh, school of thought it's well it's not it's not very uh, long time ago actually it's only about 30 years ago okay and there's a chronology how this is found okay scientists do not just one day decide okay um, this um, we have decided from the table periodic table of elements 17 elements are needed for the plant growth and reproduction no this is a, a continuous process you can see from the chronology um, the element and when scientists found its essentiality in plants okay it started in the 1800s you can see this is like um 200 years ago right so it gets progressively start with the see start with what it start with the cho the framework okay and then progressively all the way until nickel okay in the 90 1887 right so how 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 sci scientists know this so they use the the hydroponic technique okay uh, they can use the hydroponic technique or just the the regular um soil culture they they provide everything then they just take out one element each time to see if this element is removed can the plant complete the life cycle Okay, so that's why it's a it's a lengthy process. You need to see the effects of eliminating these elements to the plant. Okay, right. So here's the um, summary of the essential plant nutrient. We're using the seventeen um, elements. Okay, three framework elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then you have the macronutrients, you have the micronutrient. For the micronutrients, you have your primary and secondary nutrients, okay? Primary, secondary. And for the micronutrients, you have uh, the, these eight, okay? Bear in mind, micronutrients, at least you need eight, but sometimes if your fertilizer can provide more that can be beneficial to the plant but in essence you only need this okay, micronutrient okay yeah okay so that's that's when the terminologies of essential and beneficial comes in place okay when nutrients are essential it means the absence of the nutrients will prevent the plants from completing its life cycle okay so it's needed regardless beneficial if it's not present it's fine the plant can complete the life cycle but if it's present it can stimulate the growth and development the plant is happier okay so these elements include the um, sodium uh, silicon and also SE this is selenium okay. so this is quite different with us humans nutritional needs okay because um, selenium this is essential to us especially for um, for male okay for male this is uh, of of uh, essence uh, because this involves uh, with uh, uh, the reproduction okay so without which uh, probably you cannot appropriate um, um, the, for the species uh, further right so um, remember we have the framework nutrients the CHO and then we have the macronutrient this is just to, to uh, review again right so that um, when you are on your own when you read this you do it repeatedly so that it can get into your head right okay oh yeah special note here cobalt sodium vanadium and silicon are sometimes called beneficial plant nutrients okay not required okay but if they are present then that's good right and they belongs 
under the micronutrients category okay in addition to the original how many original eight micronutrients what are the original i i expect you to memorize this okay all these uh, 17 um, elements okay so the micronutrients include the iron manganese zinc boron copper um, chloride it's not chloride actually this is um, chlorine let's see Chlor chlorine chloride not choline choline is something like chlorine sometimes Google suggestion really not helping. Let's see. Okay, chlorine it's the element. Chloride is an anion. This this guy here got the uh, charge here. Okay, right. So this is the one that comes with the minus one. All right. So some nomenclature can be confusing. I I can understand that, but please bear in mind. They might sound alike, but chemically they act differently. Okay. Chlorine is the element that you see on the periodic table of element. Chloride is what you have when what the plants um, absorb. Okay. Yeah. So please get your terminologies correct. Okay. Right. So how you you can see here and uh, the plants nutrients the elements are classified based on the abundance abundance in plants. abundance in plant that's why uh, we use the words as the framework macronutrients and micronutrient meaning that for the framework elements these present the most macronutrient the second and micronutrient the least okay there is another way scientists use um, to um, classify the el these elemental needs uh, of the plants okay so the classification of plant nutrient can be also be based on the biochemistry and also the physiology okay for the biochemical um, classification um, we have uh, four groups okay we have group one group two group three and group four okay so these are be basing on the biochemicals roles of these elements um, um, in the plant okay for the group one um, these are, are just uh, these are just the description I'll go straight to the um, table so the group one is the nutrients that are part of the carbon compound so this is the, the backbone the fundamentals of the organisms okay so you you have um, your um, uh, nitrogen and also sulfur okay and then group group two these nitrogen sulfur attached to the your framework okay and then group two um, nutrients that are important in energy storage and structural integrity so you have your phosphate um, silicon and also boron and then you have group three which is um, in ionic form okay you can see here group three yeah they are in ionic state okay they are not like um, elements in from from other group okay in in other group uh, uh, they they involve in the reactions uh, for there are many biochemical reactions okay I, I think you from your biochemistry lesson you know there are many reactions that happen uh, the hydrolysis esterification you know there's, there's so much going on 
and each of these elements involve in that, right? So, um, but when they um, have different roles or react differently um, in, in, in terms of biochemistry, they are grouped together based on the same behavior. That's why we get uh, all of this uh, grouping system, okay? So, and finally, for the group number four, these are the elements presented in the chelates. Chelates means, um, chelate from the word claw, claw, uh, they are, they, they are bound, bound, bound to something. Okay. Meaning that they, they don't, they are not present on their own, but they are rather, um, chelated or clawed to, to other, other substance. Okay. Right. So much of these are actually involved in as the um, for the enzyme uh, reactions. Uh, they are required in a very small amount. But if one is not present, for example, let's take one. Um, um, the zinc. If the zinc is not happen, some of the biochemical reactions in the photosynthesis can happen as well. All right. So when 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 this is happening the plants cannot function well just imagine if photosynthesis cannot happen can the plants grow eventually the growth will stop and the plant will grow stunted and sadly it's going to die very soon as well right so these elements according to the biochemical classification they are required okay but depending on the rules that they have okay All right All right um, I I don't go into detail about this uh, classification because this is not crop um, crop nutrition um, course um, I, I, I I did teach crop nutrition a, a few years uh, back uh, if you are interested with this course to learn further about all these nutrients uh, classification and absorption in the plant maybe you can take it uh, uh, in your, I think in your start your third year, you can take AGR four four o one. All right, not not with me. I don't think they will um, because we have more lecturers now. I thought that before because uh, the, the the faculty didn't uh, didn't have lots of lecturers to teach this, so that's why I had to teach that. Right. Okay. Right. So when you have a plant presented like this, you can. Now, no. Each nutrients, number one, each nutrients, they have functions in certain parts of the plant. Some nutrients are always present throughout the plants, like the framework nutrients. It is present in the stem, it is present in the leaf, it is present in the flower, it's present in the fruit. Okay, some nutrients they are present for this specific function of the plant. For example, to create a more root mass, you need phosphorus. Okay, to to make a, a leaf, lots of leaf, you need and lots of nitrogen. Okay, and for the reproduction, you need the uh, zinc, magnesium, boron, phosphorus, and uh, for the um, stress management, um, you need um, potassium, zinc, copper, calcium, iron, and to some degree, actually sil silicon as well. Right. Okay. Now, what impacts can the soil have on the plant nutrients? <clears throat> you, you see, in the soils, there, there are various elements present. Okay, there are various um, nutrients are present. However, not all, not all of them are available to the plant. Just because they are present, the nutrient does not mean they are available they can be available for the plant to uptake and absorb into the body if certain criteria are met first okay one of the criteria that affects nutrient availability is the pH okay all right so let's look at here this is the this is the midline this is the ph neutral 
as you can see here when the pH is too acidic like in here it's like in too acidic here meaning that um, below below 5 towards this side much of the macronutrients are like insufficient macro okay but when it's too alkaline as you can see here much of the micro insufficient so the best bet for the plant is to have slightly acidic it is around here this region here So when you have your pH of your soil or your nutrient solution, if you're dealing with hydroponic, if the pH stays within this region, you're going to get your best bet because both of your macronutrients and also your micronutrients are going to be available for the plants. Okay. So the pH of the soil, the pH of the water, they're going to change. Um, over time okay that but the plants have the mechanism to balance this and uh, so that these nutrients are, are present to the plant when it's needed okay right okay so um, how how the um, ions of these elements okay remember remember one thing um, the the elements that you have learned the 70 elements that you learned they they some of them they are absorbed in the form of ions specifically cation okay how plants there, there are many mechanisms to this okay but um, we're not going to go into deep but one of the methods there are many methods of how plants the roots of the plants absorb the uh, the nutrients one of uh, the method is the root has um, release lots of this um, hydrogen when this hydrogen is released it will displace all this cation cation cations remember this is the plus positive so these cations includes um, uh, nutrients like uh, potassium magnesium calcium and and copper so when this happen this hydrogen will displace all these cations and when they are displaced from where from the soil particles they are going to be available to be absorbed into the roots okay right so um, this is one way of nutrient absorption by the root that that is all you need to know up to this point actually bear in mind there are, there are more methods to this okay yeah so it shows you that the root hair is very important so let's look at the root hair what what's the deal with the plant root okay so this is your um, your root the regular root that you always see remember roots got the zone various zones okay we have the meristematic zone we have the elongation zone and the maturation zone so the um, meristematic zone is actually right in this region okay not the apex okay this is not the the youngest or the meristematic zone okay this is actually part of the structure that is called the root cap okay so you got the meristematic zone, then you got your elongation zone, and got you get your maturation zone. So in the maturation zone, you will have this special structure called the root hair. Root hair actually is the outgrowth, outgrowth of the epidermis. Hmm. There are so many root hairs. Why? Because this improves the surface area when the surface area increase the plants can absorb more water and nutrients right yeah. 
you can see from here there are various um, um, elements actually in the in the ionic forms that can be absorbed uh, throughout the uh, root um, regions for example the calcium is typically absorbed in the apical regions and potassium nitrate ammonia absorbed in the elongation um, uh, region and so on this is not uh, the universal for like every single species follow this kind of absorption scheme no but kind of in general to to show you that the roots is actually a very active location it 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 deals with the absorption of these various um, nutrients depending on the region of the root this is very small okay this is maybe like um from here to here maybe like one millimeter only but you can see um, the complexity of the structure how 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 it gets so complex to the point all these elements and nutrients can be absorbed very efficiently okay so at this point i i expect you to familiar enough with this anatomy of the root the regions of the roots meristematic elongation and maturation and also the roots maybe you need to be able at this level now to to understand and to know the structure for example in the middle here this is your vascular structure so in vascular you got your phloem and your xylem okay and then you have your root hairs you, you got your epidermis and then right after the um, epidermis you get your ground tissue of your root which is the cortex cortex okay and then you will have your endodermis why do you need to know this because these have impact on the on the journey of the nutrients absorbed okay which you're going to see in a bit right and then you're going to see right in the middle um, your vascular system right yeah. so look at look at the the, um, the graph the graph here this is your root going the, up this way this is the nutrient concentration in the soil going this way this is distant from the root surface you can see here when you are farther from the root surface the nutrients concentration is also um, depleting okay it's also depleting so what's what's the problem here can you see there is a gap here there is a gap and there's a gap here so the plant actually even though it can on its own absorb lots of nutrients but it's still not efficient okay some regions still are not accessible to the root okay hence that's why you 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 get this okay so how do plants deal with this this is when um, the symbiotic relationship with other micro especially fungus come into play okay the mycorrhizal association association okay when the roots have some kind of association with uh, other organisms for example this mycorrhizal fungi it improves the nutrients um, absorption in terms of the area see the, 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 the fungus can grow into into the region so it can even 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 though um, it's this the distance from the root surface is farther now these fungus can act like the extra hands to grab the nutrients from the farther region okay so there is uh, a few types of, of the mycorrhizal interaction. What, the first type is the ectotrophic mycorrhiza. Ectotrophic means that this mycorrhiza, ecto means outside. Trophic, it means surface. Meaning that this mycorrhiza do not um, 
penetrate the cells or the tissue inside the root. They just live on the surface that you see here. It's just on the surface or in between cell, in the crevices of the cell, but never inside the cell. You can see all this, um, all this uh, fungal, fungal um, sheath here. They're just growing among the cells, in between the cells, and on the surface of the cell or the root tissue, but never inside of it. Okay, so that's why it's called the ectotrophic mycorrhiza. Okay, collectively, this is form when it's form some the netting structure like this. This is called the hartig net. Okay, so what's what's the the value of having um, this kind of mycorrhiza association? So the fungal hyphae, this year, this hyphae, is finer than the root has. So it can reach beyond nutrient depleted zones in the soil near the root, meaning that the regions where the roots are not able to reach, the uh, hyphae of the fungus, they can do the job instead. Okay, so what what do the the roots uh, the the fungus get from this? Well, this is an association. So the fungus can get number one, they can get a home, and secondly, they can get wherever that the roots secretes. So the roots going to secrete lots of things, as you can as you have seen earlier, it secretes uh, hydrogen. It can also secrete various amino acids, sugars, and ex lots of exudates. We call it exudates. Exudate. So these can be uh, the food for the fungus, right? So the fungus is very very happy, and the roots is also very very happy. So this is a is a happy happy relationship. Okay. The second type is it's the vesicular arbuscular mycorrhiza fungi. This is a bit different because this guy here they never penetrate. They are ectotrophic meaning that they live outside the surf or just on the surface but for this vesicular arbuscular they penetrate inside okay the hyphae growth um, inside um, the cells in the cortex here so this is your epidermis this is your cortex okay so it grows on the surface as the ectotrophic um, uh, mycorrhiza here and also it grows inside the um, cortex tissue okay so what does it do why the name is like this so vesicular vesicular um, referring to the ves vesicles that this um, mycorrhiza produce in the cortex cell this is the vesicles okay the small balloons here arbuscular this is actually Latin, I think. It's arbor. Arbor means tree. Where is the tree looking? This region here. You see? When it penetrates, besides uh, creating the um, vesicles looking structure, it also creates this um, branch looking uh, structure that we call as the Arbuscule. Okay. So what does this uh, do? It improves the absorption by the hyphae, okay, reaching beyond the nutrient depleted zone. Okay, so the function is the same, but the anatomy, the structure is different than the aptotrophic. But the the very important thing is this type of mycorrhizal association. It grows inside um, the cortex in addition to the surface. Okay, right. Okay, so this is the um, the summary of it. All right. So ectotrophic, simple diffusion from the hyphae in the heart net to the root of the cell. Okay, for the uh, vesicular arbuscular mycorrhiza, uh, you have the simple diffusion like the ectotrophic mycorrhiza and also the arbuscules degenerate as new as new ones are forming so the nutrients release into the whole cell 
So this structure here, they're not going to be in here forever. When when they um, degenerate or degrade, the nutrients are going to be released into the cells. Whose cells? The root cell, the cortex cell, and this can be absorbed by the root. Okay, so it's going to be a happy, happy um, uh, situation eventually for um, the symbiotic relationship. Okay, I think this is a very, very fascinating um, phenomenon um, um, in nature. Okay, so at first it looks like this uh, fungus kind of like oh I I. I just want to it looks parasitic at first but eventually um, when it has managed to um, create the reproductive structure um, this part uh, is going to die eventually the dead part actually um, is the part that is going to be um, beneficial um, to the root cortex but in the process they going they, they are helping with the nutrient absorption as well okay all right about the nutrient so the nutrient has been absorbed now you learn that the nutrient has been absorbed uh, by the roots you know release some some kind of uh, substance like the hydrogen to displace the cations from the soil surface and also um, there's a, some mycorrhizal association with the roots so how how the nutrient travel from the soil now into the root and then to the rest of the plant so there, there's a several pathway um, that you're going to see now. So there's number one is called the apoplast uh, pathway. This is the continuous system of in the um, cell wall. Okay. Um, so this is your uh, let me put it this way. So this is your soil. Okay. So your nutrient get absorbed into your root hair and that is going to travel across these various um, cells along the way. So it's going to meet with the epidermis, it's going to meet with the cortex cells and then it's going to meet with the, uh, okay, this guy here, the endodermis, pericycle and then eventually the xylem and phloem right in the middle, right? when it only go across um, the cell wall it is called the apoplastic pathway okay how do you let me let me um, you can see here it doesn't get into the cell here not in the middle of cell it kind of detouring around the cells using the cell wall pathway so apoplast is actually the cell wall path okay and then you have the second one which is the transmembrane and the third one is the um, simplast so what's the difference now is for the symplastic pathway instead of um, going along the cell wall like you saw earlier now it goes through the cell from one cell to another cell to another cell to another cell across the what you have in the middle here across the cytoplasm Okay. If it does not um, penetrate the plasma membrane, but only through the tunnel that you see here, can you see the tunnel here? This tunnel here that connects the, all these um, cells here, this, these are called plasmo, plasmo uh, desmata. So these are the tunnels. When the movement of the nutrients and water go through the cytoplasm and through the tunnels to to the next cells, without going through the plasma membrane or cell wall, 
this is called the simplest pathway but when it goes through the plant membrane like here I'm just going to yeah something like this the movement you can see you you can see here um, does it use the plasmodes mata no it just goes through this so when it goes through um, like this it is called trust membrane because it crosses the plasma membrane <clears throat> I have I have this um, this summary of, of this uh, movement okay so you have three you have your apoplast represented by the dotted line you see the movement of the water so this is your soil okay this is your root hair it only uses the cell wall okay only use the, the cell wall all right up to this point in the endodermis okay this is what you need to to pay attention to in the endodermis there is a presence of a uh, an um, impermeable structure it's called Casparian strip okay. so this is impermeable so the apoplastic pathway can only be true from the root hair up to the cortex when it comes to the endodermis this is the movement of the nutrients and water is forced to undergo this movement here which is the simplest pathway so the simplest pathway gas absorbed you go through your cytoplasm and then you go through the tunnel this is the tunnel here this is your plasmodesmata plasmodesmata okay and then you're going to see that it goes through the plasmodesmata all the way until the xylem vessel okay and the third one is the transmembrane this guy here it doesn't care it just um, get absorbed into the cell wall and then goes through the cytoplasm and then it it penetrates this you can see the blue line here this is your plasma membrane I'm sorry plasma membrane and then it goes through all the way until the xylem vessel okay so um, please um, remember this this pathway of the nutrients and water okay if it's transmembrane it can be that way from the root hair all the way until the xylem vessel but if the apoplast it's not possible it only possible from the cortex and then when it comes to endodermis apoplastic pathway is stopped okay but from the pericycle to the parenchyma and to the xylem vessel, it can be the apoplastic again. For the simplest, um, yes, it can be um, from the root hairs, um, from the cortex, endodermis, and so on. As long as you have plasmodesmata. If suddenly one of these cells do not have plasmodesmata, it is forced to use the transmembrane or apoplastic pathway okay so so please remember this is your root anatomy you have various cells in here and then you have your um, special endodermis that contains the casparin strip this is the casparin strip okay it is in the cell wall that's why the apoplastic pathway is stopped and the, the journey of the nutrients is um, is prevented and forced to use the transmembrane or the symplastic pathway all right okay so what do you get from all of this after you have underst understood this so far you, it shows that you can manipulate mineral transport in the plants to increase the plant growth yield increase the plant nutritional quality and density and also to increase the removal of soil contaminants okay uh, this is actually for for not for the uh, yield but for the environment you can use crop 
to clean uh, contaminated land. Okay, we can use that, and the 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 process is called phyto remediation. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um. I think for for degree level that is all that you need to know because uh, from from this part here until all this down here this is actually meant for the post postgraduate or the the uh, crop nutrition uh, class however however i would uh, strongly suggest you to read beyond this okay it, it's it's not difficult it's it's just uh, it tells you about the the um, what kind of nutrients uh, present in the plants that we that you actually do it you have no but you are you know by now and the relative concentration and also the um, the amount of micronutrients um, in terms of dry matter okay and this is actually for the crop nutrition class okay you can read you can read it does uh, maybe it can help for your further understanding okay but um one thing i if if it's good for you to know um some elements in the plants they are mobile and immobile okay so mobile elements meaning that they can move from one tissue to another tissue meaning that if the tissue is old and senescing it can be remobilized to much younger and actively growing tissue so these are the mobile um, elements but however some elements are immobile like this calcium sulfur iron boron so meaning that they stay in the tissue forever okay they just uh, they, they do not live okay so that's why this is important uh for the when you are diagnosing the plants okay when the, the the symptoms are showing uh, in the old leaves usually it involves the mobile nutrients but when the symptoms are this, uh, by symptoms here i mean the symptoms of uh, insufficiency is seen in young leaves or young parts of the plant it involves the immobile uh, nutrients okay all right um, I think um, that is all for for today. Yep, yep, that is all for today. So I hope um, you have learned something. I think maybe lots lots of things you have learned. Okay. All right. Uh, what's the time now? Okay, eight forty eight. So um, I'll be around uh, until uh, I give you another five minutes or so until eight. 53 if you have any question um you can ask okay <clears throat> or maybe you can ask uh, when you see me again on um wednesday to relap so i'll be here okay you got any question just ask until 8 53 Oh please, please do your assignment, okay? From from before the mid semester break, your uh, photo respiration uh, assignment. Remember, you have a a, a couple of uh, question you need to answer. So um, yes, yeah, that's uh, please do that with your group mate. So this um, Wednesday, when you come to the um, to the lab, um, let's see what have you answered okay because this is going to be your carry mark so um, if you have done your lab report or you want to 
ask me about your lab reports if you're uncertain about anything you can ask me on this um, uh, Wednesday okay if you're done you let me know that you're done uh, I'll just uh, mark all your lab reports okay just submit in the folders provided okay if you have time do it right away okay I don't want you to be too busy at the end of the semester okay it's just too too bustling don't do that okay if you're done you want to get it over with whenever you see me during the lab you have your maybe you want to lab bring your laptop show it to me if it's good it's good and just submit all right and remember you got your first test okay and please do that as well Okay, uh, if, you, if you have haven't got any more further question, I think that's all for today. So thank you for joining in and I'll see you again on Wednesday.